It gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, this is actually uh, Ryan Hanley's second trip to Mercer. He first spoke at Mercer in 2010. And when Charlie and I decided last year that we wanted to do a semester of programming on Adam Smith, we knew that we had to get him to come back. Uh, Professor Hanley received his bachelor's degree from the University of Pennsylvania, his master's of philosophy from Cambridge University, and his PhD from the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. He currently serves as an associate professor of political science at Marquette University. Prior to coming to Marquette, he was a Mellon postdoctoral fellow at Yale. In addition to numerous articles and book chapters on Enlightenment thought, and the Scottish Enlightenment in particular, he is the author of the very fine book, Adam Smith and the Character of Virtue, uh, published by Cambridge University Press in 2009. He's also co-editor of the five-volume work, The Enlightenment, Critical Concepts and History. In addition, he's the editor of the Penguin Classics edition of Adam Smith's Theory of Moral Sentiments and the editor of the forthcoming Adam Smith, A Princeton Guide. <laughs> Professor Hanley also serves as president of the International Adam Smith Society. And on top of all that, he finds time to play mandolin in a bluegrass band. <laughs> I've known uh, Professor Hanley for close to 15 years now. I'm proud to call him a friend, and I've admired his work throughout his career. And his lecture tonight is titled, Adam Smith on Living a Life. Please join me in giving him a warm Mercer welcome. Well, thanks very much, Will, for that very kind introduction, even if you did out me as a bluegrass musician, which I suppose now that I'm south of the Mason-Dixon line, that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, and thank you all for your presence here tonight. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be with you this evening uh, to begin this wonderful conference sponsored by this wonderful institute. So thanks very much for having me back. Uh, with that, let's get to business here. Um, whatever else it may also be, life in our modern world is busy. Our natures and the nature of our world conspire to pull us in multiple directions and often all at once. Any given moment thus finds us attempting to navigate multiple identities, from worker and citizen to parent and spouse, multiple associations, from workplace and school to neighborhood and club, and multiple desires, from external goods to internal tranquility. In contemporary philosophical parlance, we today necessarily inhabit a series of overlapping and often competing life worlds. But what, what effect must all of this necessarily have on us? At the birth of commercial modernity in the Enlightenment, itself the birth of a great number of these pressures, or at least a more profound awareness of them, several efforts were made to diagnose the effects of these competing life worlds on the individual. Among the most prominent and important of these diagnoses was that of Adam Smith's sometime interlocutor, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau began his masterwork, The Emile, by laying out these competing obligations and then stating what he saw as their necessary effect on us. And I quote now from the Emile, quote, from these contradictions is born the one we constantly experience within ourselves, swept along in contrary routes by nature and by men, forced to divide ourselves among these different impulses. We follow a composite impulse, which leads us to neither one goal nor the other. Thus, in conflict and floating during the entire course of our life, we end it without having been able to put ourselves in harmony with ourselves and without having been good either for ourselves or for others. This is how Rousseau introduces his project in a meal and arguably his project throughout his corpus, namely to devise a means whereby individuals might recapture that unity which seems to be so imperiled by the pressures of life in our modern world and thereby establish a means of living which might, as Rousseau says, render us at once good for ourselves and good for others. Now, Rousseau's own answer to these challenges was nothing if not controversial. Yet his voice hardly cried alone in the wilderness. For even if he was alone in defending a certain response to this challenge, his fundamental worry was one shared by several others, including, especially, Adam Smith. Both Smith's life and work are in fact animated to a striking degree by a concern to respond precisely to the challenge outlined by Rousseau, 
namely to describe a way of life that might enable us today to recover some semblance of unity and also to render ourselves good and, youthful, good and useful both to others and to ourselves. If you knew the secret of eternal youth, that would really be something. Now, this, in the way that I've just sketched it, is not how Smith's project is often seen. His spirited defense of commercial society, often taken as the whole or at least the core of his thought, hardly seems like fertile ground in which to sow the seeds of a philosophy of living, insofar especially as it seems to champion precisely those institutions that on Rousseau's diagnosis serve to corrupt us. Even some who have attended both long and carefully to Smith's moral philosophy have not found in it evidence of any engagement with concerns of this sort. Thus, it's been said by uh, one of the modern editors of one of the modern editions of the theory of moral sentiment <laughs> that for Smith, the aim of moral philosophy is simply to provide an account of the origin and function of our moral concepts, and that once we've done this, we have nothing more to say. And that, quote, if we want guidance on how to live the good life, we should look elsewhere. But this view, however common and dominant among scholars today, was not always dominant. In Smith's own day, his work was regarded quite differently and was in fact thought by more than a few to be concerned precisely to provide such guidance. Smith himself claimed that the true aim of ethics is, quote, to establish and confirm the best and most useful habits of which the mind of man is susceptible. And Dugald Stewart, his close friend and first biographer, once said of Smith's theory of moral sentiments that, quote, with the theoretical doctrines of the book, there are everywhere interwoven, with singular taste and address, the purest and most elevated maxims concerning the practical conduct of life, end of quote. A century later, interestingly, the precisely same judgment was delivered by no less a figure than the future United States President Woodrow Wilson who as a Princeton lecturer lecturing on Smith, insisted that Smith, quote, stores his volumes full with the sagest practical maxims fit to have fallen from the lips of the shrewdest of those Glasgow merchants in whose society he learned so much, end quote. Now, readers of the theory of moral sentiments need not look far for the sorts of practical maxims that Stuart and President Wilson had in mind. Whatever else it might contain, the theory of moral sentiments contains at least a series of pithy sayings delivering direct injunctions. And readers of a practically minded type are sure to find in it answers to at least a few questions of theirs. Do you wish to be successful? Smith is quick to counsel, be prudent and industrious. Do you wish to be well regarded? Cultivate your talent, said Smith. You wish to be free? Avoid excess ambition. Are you too sad or too glad? Live with strangers. Hoping to preserve your children's innocence? Homeschool them. Every one of these Smith delivers as direct injunctions to a practical intention. Clearly, Smith had some solicitude for the more practical concerns of his prudent readers. At the same time, I think we do Smith an injustice if we were to suggest that his concerns with the philosophy of living were limited to providing the sorts of practical maxims which his good friend Benjamin Franklin filled his own volumes. This was part of Smith's project, but it was far from the whole. In addition to providing practical guidance to the upwardly mobile reader, Smith also provides guidance to another sort of reader, and specifically one concerned to navigate well the challenges of living in a world in which upward mobility often leads to psychic fragmentation and can come at the expense of both the well-being of others and of ourselves. Now, Smith's effort to forestall this fragmentation begins with his effort to state clearly the extent to which its seeds have been sown in our very natures. For Smith, the natural condition of a human being is one of division, a point made powerfully in the first line of the theory of moral sentiments. How selfish soever man may be supposed, he notoriously begins, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortunes of others. Now, a great deal of work is clearly being done in this opening line and the discussion that it introduces. As scholars have long appreciated, Smith in particular here lays the foundation for his alternative understanding of human nature. On Smith's view, human nature is not simply egocentric, as Hobbes and Mandeville had argued, nor is it simply altruistic, 
as Shaftesbury and Hutchison had responded. The true condition of human nature is rather more mixed, Adam Smith thinks. Our natures contain at once both self-directed and other-directed passions. For our purposes, what's crucial is that Smith regards our natural condition as one of division, and specifically one divided between concerns for others and concerns for ourselves. But this is hardly the only division that Smith finds in our natures. For not only are we naturally divided between concerns for ourselves and concerns for others, but our self-concerns themselves exhibit a certain division. In this vein, the self-love that's fundamental to Smith's entire project is hardly some sort of static monolith that directs us to a single end. On the contrary, for Smith, the natural objects of our self-love are multiple. In his words, quote, man naturally desires not only to be loved, but to be lovely. So too, Smith says, quote, he naturally dreads not only to be hated or to be hateful. In this sense, we desire, quote, not only praise, but praiseworthiness, and dread, quote, not only blame, but blameworthiness. Now, Smith states this so simply, and indeed uses this little distinction to do so much important philosophical work, that it's easy to miss a fundamental implication of his observation. In short, our natural desires for both praise and praiseworthiness pose a foundational challenge to the individual's efforts to live well, insofar as in the world as we live in it, the least praiseworthy are often praised the most, and the most praiseworthy often praised the least, a hard truth that Smith teaches in more than one place. This being the case, the fact that quote unquote nature has endowed us, quote, not only with a desire of being approved of, but with a desire of being what ought to be approved of, this would seem to guarantee that our nature in its entirety is unlikely to be fully satisfied in the world as we know it. And even if we assume that it might be possible to discover a path whereby both of these natural desires might be gratified, it's by no means clear what this path would look like. As Smith explains in a very interesting paragraph in part one, quote, Two different roads are presented to us as means of gratifying these dual desires, both to be respectable and to be respected. Smith's locutions in this paragraph are interesting. Four times in a very brief paragraph, he divides our options into, quote, two different roads, quote, two different characters, quote, two different models, and, quote, two different pictures. The lesson seems clear. We may want it all. But we who have only one life to live must make a choice. And quite simply, it may be that no choice we can make will gratify all of our natural desires. So far from relieving the division of our natures then, our entrance into the world seems only to inflame it. It hardly ends here. Our experience of living in the world only serves to exacerbate this division already inflamed by our entrance into it. Nowhere is this so clear as in Smith's comments on anxiety. Anxiety and remorse are strikingly common and recurrent concepts in his work, though rare have been the commentators who have focused on this. But even a casual reader can't help but be struck by the force and ubiquity of Smith's accounts of the, quote, avenging furies of shame and remorse, which torture those of bad conscience. And while Smith reserves his most poignant accounts of these avenging furies, for the grossly criminal and egregiously negligent, to the degree that all human beings are necessarily less than perfect, a point that Smith makes more than once in the theory of moral sentiments, it would seem that none of us, however virtuous, are likely to be free from some degree of anxiety in our lives. All of this poses a very great challenge. We're divided by our nature. Our lives in the world exacerbate this division. And yet we seem to require some degree of unity for our happiness. How then can we achieve it? Smith's answer is surprising. In the first place, he seems to suggest that the alleviation of our division must begin with an embrace of division itself. This, at any rate, seems to be at least one fundamental element of Smith's concept of the impartial spectator presented by Smith as, in fact, the key to our alleviation of anxiety and the pursuit of praiseworthiness. What then are we doing when we attempt to enter into the perspective of the impartial spectator? Smith's answer is that we're engaged in an effort at further self-division, 
here I quote, quoting Smith from part three, quote, when I endeavor to examine my own conduct, when I endeavor to pass sentence upon it and either to approve or condemn it, it is evident that in all such cases, I divide myself as it were into two persons and that I, the examiner and judge, represent a different character from that other I, the person whose conduct is examined into and judged of. Now this strikes me as a uh, quite a clever response to a fundamental problem Smith has laid out for himself. The whole reason we're compelled to strive to become, quote, spectators of our own behavior is that, Smith thinks, we're always anxious to know not only how others judge us, but also, quote, how far we deserve their censure or applause. Put differently, our competing desires for both praise and praiseworthiness give rise to an anxiety that's best assuaged, Smith thinks, only by the further division of the self. This, I think, is not only a clever argument in itself, but one that deserves recognition as a precursor to several topics within contemporary psychotherapeutic anxiety management, but leaving that for uh, a very different occasion. Uh, in Smith, what's important for us is that this impartial spectator emerges in the first instance as an effort to recover some degree of unity within ourselves in the face of division. But how successful, we might wonder, is it likely to be at solving the fundamental problem Smith has set out for himself? Here a certain challenge arises. Smith clearly thinks that impartial spectatorship of the self can help restore the tranquility so often disturbed by anxieties prompted by the world's judgment of our characters and of our merits. And this, to be sure, isn't to be sniffed at. Insofar as it can make good at this, the impartial spectator is able to do what Smith elsewhere pointedly says, quote unquote, reason and philosophy cannot do. Further, if indeed Smith, as Smith thinks, quote, happiness consists in tranquility and enjoyment, the efforts of the impartial spectator to promote such tranquility are to be greatly welcomed. At the same time, as we read on further into Smith, it seems that there's something more that's needed than merely tranquility. At the very least, true happiness, as he comes to describe it, seems to require not merely the clean conscience of the man who knows that he has done no harm to others, but also the self-approbation of the person who knows that she has done positive good for others. Put slightly differently, even if the impartial spectator succeeds in helping to establish the tranquility that renders us good for ourselves, it yet remains to be supplemented by a type or form of commitment that renders us good for others. Now, Smith himself seems to be clearly aware of this problem. His notorious portrait of the just person whose virtue consists merely in, quote, sitting still and doing nothing attest to the degree to which he's conscious of the difference between mere tranquility and being genuinely good for others. In particular, where the former can be done passively, the latter requires activity. Fortunately, though, Smith thinks, we're inclined precisely to such activity by our natures, a point that he makes especially clear in what is, to my mind, the most striking passage to be found in the many thousands of pages that constitute the entirety of his corpus. Quote, man was made for action and to promote by the exertion of his faculties such changes in the external circumstances of both himself and of others as may seem most favorable to the happiness of all. He must not be satisfied with indolent benevolence nor fancy himself the friend of mankind because in his heart he wishes well to the prosperity of the world that he may call forth the whole vigor of his soul and strain every nerve in order to produce the ends which it is the purpose of his being to advance. Nature has taught him that neither himself nor mankind can be so fully satisfied with his conduct nor bestow upon it the full measure of applause unless he has actually produced them." End of long quote. This is an arresting statement for more reasons than one and I think deserves that long quotation. For present purposes, Smith here suggests that our natures not only incline us towards both praise and praiseworthiness, but also incline us to seek praiseworthiness in a particular way, 
namely through an activity for which we've been fashioned in a wholehearted and unified sense, and indeed meant to pursue with the entirety of our body and the entirety of our soul. Now, how exactly, though, might a naturally divided individual pursue this single end in this single-minded manner? And how can an individual naturally divided between concerns for himself and concerns for others come to dedicate himself to others in the way Smith recommends and thereby reach those ends that he says nature has intended for us? Simple exhortation simply isn't going to be enough. What's needed is a means by which we might overcome not only the internal division of ourselves, but also our external division of ourselves from others. And how is this to be done? Here too, Smith offers an answer that will at first seem counterintuitive. If we hope to be in harmony with others, our first obligation is to pursue the perfection of ourselves. But what is it that saves this pursuit of self-perfection from devolving into mere selfishness? It seems to be that something about the unique vision of perfection itself that Smith is espousing is necessary here. Hence Smith's words for describing this perfection. Quote, and hence it is that to feel much for others and little for ourselves, that to restrain our selfish and to indulge our benevolent affections constitutes the perfection of human nature and can alone produce among mankind that harmony of sentiments and passions in which consists their whole grace and propriety." End quote. Now again, several things seem to me striking here. The first is the way in which Smith conceives the pursuit of self-perfection. On his view, the pursuit of efforts to better ourselves is far from an egocentric enterprise. So far from leading us further back into ourselves, self-perfection, when properly pursued, leaves us out of ourselves towards others. So far from being at odds, the perfection of the self and the harmony of society are not only commensurate, but in fact necessary for each other. This, in turn, suggests a second striking element of Smith's account. For Smith, self-perfection substantially consists not in a greater love of the self, but in a transcendence of self-love, one that brings us closer to others. Hence, in his most explicit account of quote-unquote perfect virtue, Smith claims that, quote, the man of the most perfect virtue, the man whom we naturally love and revere the most, is he who joins to the most perfect command of his own original and selfish feelings, the most exquisite sensibility, both to the original and sympathetic feelings of others, end quote. With this in place now, we can begin to see what else will be needed to close the gap between and to transcend the natural divide between our self-concern and our concern for others. It seems to be virtue, and indeed, quote unquote, perfect virtue, and indeed perfect virtue of a very specific sort that can affect this. In particular, it's the perfect virtue of the individual who has cultivated what Smith calls, quote, two different sets of virtues. On the one hand, quote, the virtues of candid condescension and indulgent humanity that lead us out of ourselves. And on the other hand, quote, the virtues of self-denial, of self-government, of that command of the passions that come from appreciation of the judgments of others on ourselves. Thus, even self-perfection, we might say, consists in overcoming self-division, insofar as it consciously requires us to cultivate two very different sorts of virtues, very rarely found together in a single person. What Smith, following his friend Hume, calls the amiable virtues that lead us out of ourselves to others, and the awful virtues that limit our self-centeredness and make it possible for us to move beyond self-concern. Now. As Smith comments on virtue and perfection attest, a principal aim of his vision of self-perfection, or perfect virtue, is the transcendence of our division, and indeed on two levels. Insofar as the person of the most perfect virtue exhibits both amiable and awful virtues, their perfection aims to synthesize those two sides of our nature, selfish and altruistic, to which Smith calls our attention in the opening of the theory of moral sentiments. Also, insofar as the perfection of human nature serves to, quote, produce among mankind that harmony of sentiments and passions that enables us to live with others, such perfection overcomes our separation from others, 
Smith's theory of virtue thus itself deserves to be seen as his answer to both the division within the self and the division of the self from others. But yet we might wonder, even if virtue can cure these divisions, how can we pursue it in practice? Is it necessary, is it enough merely to will it or desire it to be so? Or is some other action or capacity necessary as well? In Smith's response to this challenge lies, I think, perhaps the most interesting and important element of his moral theory. If we wish to pursue virtue, and indeed to cultivate not only the excellence that leads us to seek the well-being of others, but in fact to overcome our ever-present natural self-concern, a good will may be necessary, but it won't be sufficient. What we also need is a capacity, Smith says, to reimagine our place in the world, and indeed to reimagine our very relationship to others. This is an extraordinarily challenging and demanding enterprise, as Smith knows. He himself calls it, quote, the hardest of all the lessons of morality, end quote, but it's indispensable to his entire project. At the core of this enterprise lies an effort to transcend the self-love that leads us always to prefer ourselves to others. The key task on this front, Smith suggests, is to overcome our own natures. By nature, Smith often tells us we're animated by a self-concern that inclines us to value our own well-being over that of others. What Smith himself calls, quote, the natural preference which every man has for his own happiness above that of other people, end quote. Now, Smith, of course, celebrates this disposition when well-challenged and well-regulated. The illustration of its practical effects is, of course, the entire core of his economics. But as a moral philosopher, Smith is concerned to illustrate the ways in which this same natural capacity, when left unregulated, impedes and perhaps imperils our efforts to be good both for ourselves and for others. Now, the effect of excessive self-preference, that's Smith's term, is a prominent theme in, in throughout his works. One thinks, at least readers of Smith, will think immediately of his cautionary parable of the poor man's son and the misery his ambition brings upon him. Rather than revisit this now, knowing that it will become a focus of uh, later talks within the conference, I want to focus instead on Smith's vision of the danger such excessive self-preference poses to our relationship to others. In this vein, Smith is prone to insist that an individual who enters the world believing that others ought to regard him in the same light in which he naturally is inclined to view himself is necessarily bound for disappointment and misery. What seems natural to him, Smith says, quote, must always appear excessive and extravagant to them, unquote. Thus our dilemma as naturally self-loving individuals who yet must live alongside other naturally self-loving individuals. Nature may incline us each to one view, but social harmony demands that we adopt another. And it's for the sake of overcoming nature in this sense that we not, need not merely virtue or a mere goodwill, but rather this very capacity to reimagine ourselves. Thus Smith's striking insistence, repeated three times directly in the same words over the course of the theory of moral sentiments, that we must correct, quote, the natural inequality of our sentiments and indeed compensate for the natural misrepresentations of self-love by coming to appreciate, still quoting Smith, that we are but one of the multitude in no respect better than any other in it, end of quote. Short of this fundamental reimagining of ourselves, and specifically that reimagining that leads us to appreciate the equality of our interests with those of others, not only will we remain susceptible to what Smith calls absurd self-love or unjust preference that always threatens our attempts at peace and justice, but will be unable to cultivate that, quote, sense of what is due to our fellow creatures, which is the basis of justice and of society, end quote. For Smith, then, genuine excellence consists in transcending our self-love and coming to dedicate ourselves to the promotion of the well-being of others. All well and good to say, but what will this look like in the world? Smith gives us a portrait of such an individual in action in the form of the one he calls the quote-unquote wise and virtuous man. This is the peak feature, figure, I should say, in Smith's ethics, 
And the excellence of his character lies in his cultivation of two specific dispositions. First, the wise and virtuous man achieves unity within himself. In contrast to others whose lives are animated by their solicitude for the external goods of wealth and recognition, and hence divided by their need for tranquility and their desires for goods that take them out of their selves, the wise and virtuous man exhibits a certain indifference to fortune, what Smith himself calls a, quote, magnanimous resignation, or, quote, reverential submission that leads him to welcome the sacrifice of his own interests to those of what he calls, quote, the greater interest of the universe. But it's important to be clear about what this submission will and will not demand. At first glance, it seems akin to the apathy of the Stoic sage, which regards, quote, all the events of human life as in a great measure indifferent, Smith says. With the Stoic sage, Smith's wise man shares a detachment that preserves a certain tranquility. But he differs from the Stoic sage in rejecting any suggestion that we ought to regard as indifferent all the events of human life, and especially the events of human life that cause misery and suffering to others. For Smith, the pursuit of unity and tranquility within ourselves must never lead to disengagement from others, for it's exactly at this moment that one's concern to be good for oneself becomes inimical to one's calling to be good for others. Herein then lies the second element of the wise and virtuous man's excellence. The wise and virtuous man, Smith thinks, not only embodies the perfection of the awful virtues that afford us a proper perspective on ourselves, but he also exhibits the perfection of the amiable virtues that testify to the degree of our commitment to others. A wise and virtuous man thus not only exhibits a magnanimous resignation to the world and embraces his humble status in it, but also comes to appreciate and even delight in his essential equality with others, an equality that leads him not only to overcome excessive self-admiration and presumption, but also leads him to be good for others in the most practical of senses. As Smith says, quote, far from insulting over the inferiority of others, he views it with the most indulgent commiseration, and by his advice as well as example, is at all times willing to promote their further advancement, end quote. So how then does a wise and virtuous man do this? Smith offers some hint, I think, in his life, and it's here that I'd like to end. To see this, we have to see this life in a different light in which it's often seen. To many today, Adam Smith remains the awkward Scotch professor described by the founding editor of The Economist magazine, Walter Bagehot, who uh, Bagehot says is, quote, always choked with books and absorbed in abstractions. It's this image of the absent-minded professor that's lasted of Adam Smith. And however fair it may or may not be to Smith the man, I think it's overshadowed another arguably more crucial side of both his life and his character, a side that fortunately did not escape his friend Dugald Stewart, who alongside his reports of Smith's notorious eccentricities, also called attention to Smith's, quote, ruling passion of contributing to the happiness and improvement of his society, end quote. It's a passion evident in several episodes of Smith's life, and perhaps especially in his activities as a teacher indeed one profoundly dedicated to the well-being of his students, and as a philanthropist, indeed one who donated extensively in offices of secret charity that only came to light many years after his death. <laughs> Nevertheless, ultimately it's his activities as an author, I think, that we see the clearest evidence of Smith's consciousness of the responsibilities of a wise and virtuous man. In his lectures to his students on law, Smith once argued that the provision of life's basic necessaries, and he says, meat, drink, raiment, and lodging, is in fact the proper end of quote unquote wisdom and virtue. And while Smith certainly never himself became a butcher or brewer or spinner or joiner, his literary life was dedicated to furthering this end quite clearly. And indeed, his wealth of nations, of all the accomplishments of his life, certainly the most famous and lasting, was itself I think, dedicated precisely to promoting such wise and virtuous ends, insofar as it sought to render the necessities and conveniences of human life more accessible to all. In so doing, Smith gave us reason to include him among that class of wise and virtuous men 
who have furthered those arts that he says, quote, contribute to the subsistence or the conveniency or to the ornament of human life, end quote. And insofar as the execution of the wealth of nations itself proves such a joy to Smith himself, we find in it, I think, a model for how indeed one might live a life both good for oneself and indeed good for others. Thank you very much.